This is First You Hustle, a podcast from the Columbus College of Art and Design meant to help students and budding creative professionals put their expertise to use. Today, we're talking money. After all, the whole idea about starting a career is being able to live while doing something you like. That means you need to make money. That means when you make money, you need to be able to keep as much of it as possible. That means managing your money, monitoring your credit, building good credit, knowing what to look for in loan terms, it means maybe even investing. The myth of the starving artist dies with good financial literacy. So strap in, get ready to eat your veggies. We're preparing you for adulthood, Ben Wyatt style. All right, we need to do some basic organization. Where do you put your bills when they come? I read the magazines and give the rest to Andy. Which I organize into a pile or stack that I put into the freezer so they won't get lost. Okay, you have to pay these. Good thing I didn't lose them. And we've got CCAD's very own Ben Wyatt here to help. I'm Jeffrey Fisher. I go by Jeff. Been at the college uh, 35 plus years. I'm the senior vice president and CFO, which stands for Money Guy. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordan Bell, and thanks for tuning in to First You Hustle. Today, we're talking about money. Specifically, we're talking about the financial implications of graduating and entering the real world. You know, the one full of bills. The one that might mean you need to buy a car. The one that might mean you need to buy a house. What does that mean? What should you look out for? How can you avoid losing money by poorly managing the money you have? We'll talk about some things that might surprise you. Like it might be better to have two credit cards than one, as long as you don't max out both. There are certain places you should never use a debit card. There is such a thing as good debt and bad debt. And in the world of debt, Paying off some things are more urgent than others, like paying off credit card debt before paying off student loan debt. We'll also talk about how student loan debt is manageable and the different payment plans that might help you by getting you on your feet and lower your monthly loan payment. We'll even talk about the stock market. Yeah, the stock market. I bet that's not something you ever thought you'd need to deal with, but in fact, the stock market can help you grow some long-term savings if you find the right products, get in early, and stay in for a long time. It's true. But there's a difference between a mutual fund and individual stocks. Yeah, it's not sexy. In fact, it's pretty dry stuff, but this is important. Mismanaging your finances early can set you way, way back. If you get out and saddle up a ton of credit card debt or fall for bad terms on a loan or get bad advice, it'll chain you down. It'll affect your career. This idea that creative careers aren't profitable is a myth. What propels that myth is that if you aren't wise to good financial health, then you're more likely to pay more for things, get hit with fees, find yourself underwater. This is equally plausible no matter what career field you're in. It just so happens that, and not to stereotype, creative minds tend to not care about math, not care about finances, and not understand the language of money and finances. But if you do care, and you do take the time to understand these things, then you'll be in the driver's seat. Take it from me. I've got a ton of student loan debt. My wife does too. And when we first started out, we had really, really low salaries, but we didn't let it throw us out on the street and you won't either. So I brought in Jeff Fisher, vice president of Columbus College of Art and Design, a resident money guy, to talk about some basic things, what they mean and what it implies for you. Credit scores, loans, credit cards. It's all coming your way sooner or later, so it's best to be prepared. First, let's start with credit score. How would you explain credit score to someone? And then what are the factors that help or do not help with Mm -hmm. your credit score? Well, credit score, uh, first I want to point out is something that's uh, very critical to you as an individual because it has impact on so many different things that you do. And basically, there's uh, several different agencies that compile this stuff. And what they look at is your credit history. And uh, if you are 18 years old, in all likelihood, you don't have a credit history. So when you start out on this, either you, if you go to Credit Karma or something, you know, you'll find you don't exist until you start having some actual transactions of some sort that are reported to these agencies. So uh, the reason I say it's so important, though, is because of all the different things it can affect. And that's like your rate for a mortgage, your ability to borrow. Um, It affects your insurance rates. 
it's 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 really kind of big brothery and kind of disturbing that you know they can make assumptions of you based on how you handle your credit but um, I would add it could probably even affect you getting a job because many employers will look at a credit score and figure someone with a low score lower score may not um, may not uh, be a worthy employee so uh, you know how, how do you start establishing a credit score and I did this with my kids. You know, the first thing you got to do is, you know, get some credit. And one way to do that is get what's called a secure credit card. You can't just go apply. Although for a while there, they were uh, soliciting um, uh, credit cards to students without any credit history. But uh, as, as credit tightened and after the big financial fiasco back in 2008, 2009, they tightened up on uh, – on ability to get those cards. But if you can get a card, you know, do it, get a reasonable limit. And we're talking 500 to a thousand dollars. Or if you can't get a card based on your lack of history, what you do is you get a credit card that's called a secured card. So basically it's like a debit card, you know, or something, but it's, it's, it's really based on credit. So you go to a bank or a credit union and you, um, you uh, hopefully you can accumulate five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars and say I'd like a secure card. So then after a few months, you're able to often then times unsecure it. But that's based on different factors, and primarily it is showing the ability to pay and pay on time. Mm-hmm. So if you have a good you know payment track record, generally speaking, then they will back off on having it secured and release that money back to you. Is a credit card the the only way that establishes your credit or like I always thought bills like if I pay my electric bill on time that doesn't generally utility bills and that kind of stuff are not Mm. reported to the credit agency so you can be arrears on that and oftentimes that's not part of your credit history and and I would say on even making payments um you know it's it's sort of like should you pay it in full you always want to pay your credit cards in full Mm -hmm. because what you want don't want to do is get caught with big balances because credit card interest rates are notor- notoriously bad. And, and it's kind of like, you don't want to be paying all those extra fees on, um, on, on charging items. But during that first phase, you know, where you're trying to establish credit, you want to pay more than the minimum payment, but maybe not necessarily all, you know, and again, it depends on the bank or the credit union, but, you know, do try to pay it off within a six month period. So for example, if you charge 500 bucks, the minimum payment's only going to be $20. But if you pay $100 a month, for example, then you kind of show that you were able to pay. You are going to get charged some interest. Um, but ultimately, my view is, is a credit card is a device to pay for something, not that you're borrowing for, again, because it's such bad terms, but it's just a convenience tool like a debit card, mm-hmm. and it does establish you that credit because a debit card does not, but a credit card does. Mm-hmm. So on-time payments is, is the first key. But then they also look at uh, the amount of credit you used based on your total available balance. So if you have a $1,000 limit and you're carrying that at $900 and paying $20 a month, mm-hmm. they're like, well, you're right at the edge of your credit limit. What they want to see is that you're using only X percent of your credit. So after you get your credit established, it's oftentimes wise to get another credit card or two, get your aggregate amount of limit up to maybe $5,000, and then sporadically use those other cards, pay them off. But now if you charge up to, let's say, $500, and you maybe have to carry it a couple months, you're only using a small percentage, only 10% okay. of your total credit limit. Because one might be almost maxed out, but the other two are yeah. empty. Okay. Yeah, so they're empty. <laughs> so, so, But you got a higher line. Now, of course, if that single card is willing to give you $10,000, which is doubtful, you mm-hmm. know, that's another way to do it. But generally speaking, that once you get that credit card and start establishing credit, then all of a sudden the offers are going to start coming at you. Yeah. And you I, have different options. I remember the first time I used my credit card in college, it was a $500 limit. First time I used it, like a week later, the bank said, you have a $4,000 limit now. They just <laughs> increased it out of nowhere, yeah. which is dangerous, you know, mm-hmm. because you, you, you don't want to think of that as free money. Uh, but it, credit cards aside, you know, things like student loan payments, that would go towards credit, other I, loan payments? I, I, again, it, it varies, but yes. That, and, and student loan is one of the 
really critical ones uh, that you got to think about as students. Um, I, I mean, there's multitudes of uh, things to think about within a student loan because there are there are favorable items that come with a student loan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you're paying those off, like you're actually able to deduct the, deduct the interest you pay on that, even though you're not um, uh, filing a long form where you itemize deductions. Also, you've got an interest rate that you wouldn't be able to get because um, it's backed by the federal government. So that's why you're able to get an interest rate below 10%, whereas a credit card is un- called an unsecured loan. So that's why you get 15 20% on the credit card. The government guarantees your student loan. So that's why a bank, or actually you're borrowing direct from the federal government, they took the banks out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's why they lend you direct at a much lower rate the caveat is is you can never get away from it right it's, but I, I, i've heard yeah. and i don't know if this is the right phrasing but people have explained it to me simply as student loan debt is good good debt, debt. and in credit card debt is bad yes. debt. so if you're going to be in debt on if you're going to be loading up on on paying something pay off your credit cards first absolutely and then find a way to more long-term payoff student loans. Well, and and on student loans, you have a lot of different options that don't come with credit cards and different things. So what you can do is you can uh, do income contingent. Mm -hmm. So basically it's based on your income. And they do have, although I'm I'm reading up on this, it started 10 years ago in 2008. They have a, the, the government put in a deal where if you do income contingent repayment and you work for a nonprofit, like even CCAD mm-hmm. or some other nonprofit, you're working in an industry that's doing good, you know, for the good of the whole or the good of the country and different things. We try. And, and, <laughs> yeah, the country. And, and, and what they'll do is uh, if, if you go on income contingent, pay on it solid for 10 years, then they will forgive the balance of your loans. Mm-hmm. Now, we've just hit that 10-year mark, and I was reading a story where only like 44 people out of 10,000 or something have got that to work because right. nobody understood how it worked or what it meant. They're, they're making it it's, really hard to qualify. Yeah. But that aside, which, I mean, is an issue that needs to be dealt with, it, I don't look back on – because I'm part of – I'm in the yeah. Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. I it's It was a good thing to be on income-based because mm-hmm. it was kept capped it at a fraction of my salary, and it didn't it allowed me to explore other things like I need a car and I need a place to live. Absolutely, and, and that that is what's so important because, yeah, you get out. You don't want to have a mortgage as your, mm-hmm. as, as your, uh, you know, your primary debt. And that's the and default because yeah. you know, it, it puts you into pay off your loans as quickly as possible so that mm-hmm. you pay the least amount of money, which in theory is great. But when that's a thousand dollars a month versus it, it could be a hundred dollars a month or less. Yes, that's much more affordable. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the fact you're not going to get that deal anywhere else. Nobody else is really going to give you that deal except maybe if you go through some credit counseling agency mm-hmm. where they restructure all your debt and you know try to tie it in. But 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 remember on student loans, they're they're those don't disappear. Um, you know, you always want to stay in contact with them and no matter what the circumstance is, because it's, it's not a dischargeable debt, like under bankruptcy and different things like other debt is. And I'm not suggesting anybody should go under bankruptcy, Mm -hmm. but some people think that that's a dischargeable debt and it's not. And so what that means is, is till that's paid or satisfied one way or the other, you will always be responsible for that. Right. For, <laughs> and, 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 and they have ways of uh, getting that money through your employer or mm-hmm. through your ref, you know, refunds and so on and so forth. So, but that, and that's all, you know, it's also flexible, which is, again, to emphasize that because you're put into that high payment plan doesn't mean you need to stay in it. But if you do go into that plan and then you're not paying, then they're going to garnish wages. And, right. and so it's, it's up to you as the borrower to change your status, which is pretty easy yep. to do. All that stuff can be done online. And, and they will give you a forbearance, you know, if you have a certain period of time or mm-hmm. maybe you're in transition or different things. Yeah. They're, they're all, they, they will work with you. Mm-hmm. Or you go back to school. Things. If you go get your master's mm-hmm. degree, pause on your loans again, yeah. which may or may not be a good thing. But Unless you're in default and then they won't lend you again as a master's student. Mm-hmm. So never, never get in default on ah. your student loans. But um, but but then the other types of loans, and, and again, these are things, and these are more income based. Is like you know an auto loan or a you know or a mortgage loan, and 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 with a mortgage loan, you're going to have to save up some and have a certain amount down. Although there are different programs, you know, that encourage first time buyers. But the reason one can get a mortgage loan 
or well, let's let's say let's talk about a car loan first. A car loan is almost the easiest to get in some ways because they have a piece of collateral. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you got a credit card. It's it's called unsecured debt. There's nothing behind it unless you do that secured card and change it over, and you know they already have your money. But once you go into the uh, the unsecured, they have no strong way to get their money back quickly Mm -hmm. unless they're going after you with a car. I mean, they have shows now, you know, repo men with cars and different things. Well, that's the reason a lot of people, you can see people driving cars, you know, and then they kind of just more look at your income. They will look at your credit history, but if you have a sketchier credit history, you still have a chance of getting a car loan because what the uh, seller or the company realizes is, unless you're buying it from an individual, but they're not going to finance you anyway, is that they, you know, they'll charge you an interest rate and they can go repossess the car. Mm-hmm. They know where you live. They generally know where to find you. And, um, but, but you'll be paying a higher interest rate if you don't have good credit. So again, or if you're, if you're new with credit, you'll pay a higher rate. You know, you always see these deals with 0% financing, you know, X down and all these different things, but those are more geared towards, you know, people who have good credit or people who have more established credit. So, so your first, first years, you know, out of college, you know, into your, you know, mid twenties, it is a little bit of a, you know, struggle to get the best deals because again, you're trying to establish that credit history, you know, Mm -hmm. the first time. And one of the other factors is, you know, that they look at is, is how many, um, years, how old is your credit? That's a factor in your score. Also, um, uh, you know, how many inquiries have you had? I mean, if you, if they see 12 inquiries that you keep applying Mm -hmm. at different places, you know, they're kind of, kind of raises their eyebrows. Like, well, what's, what's going on? Why do you have so many inquiries? Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of apps you can get related to a credit card. I have one like for my capital one and it, tells me, you know, all these different things. I think Credit Karma might even do it too, where you go on, it'll tell you things that affect your credit score. And what's to be expected for like interest rates? I know there's like fixed rates and there's variable rates and like for something like a car or even like a mortgage, what, what should someone be looking out for as far as that language? Yeah. Mortgage rates have come up a little bit and, and a good mortgage rate is in the four, four and a half range. Uh, you know, there's still, I think, are a couple government programs out there. I mean, I'm, I'm from an era where my first mortgage rate was 12% back mm-hmm. in the 80s. I mean, it was just bizarre back then, mm-hmm. you know, what interest rates were doing. And um, so they had peaked at an all-time low mm-hmm. back, you know, a couple years ago. But the Fed has been raising interest rates over the last couple years, you know, a quarter percent or so at a time. So mortgages are still reasonable if you look at the span going back to the 80s. They're still fairly reasonable, but um, yeah, it's it's not as good as it was maybe two years ago. Where you could probably get down to three, three and a half percent. So mm-hmm. it's up a couple percent higher. Auto rates are so variable; it really depends on what you're doing and you know the deal you're getting with the uh, dealer. But but that's why you always negotiate the price first because they could be padding you know some interest into the cost mm-hmm. of the car. There's just all sorts of different nuances in there. Um, but you should expect those to be fixed rates of you for a car loan or mortgage. If it's four and a half percent, it's always going to be, whereas credit cards, I think can jump around. Yeah. Credit cards, they can move on you anytime. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on cars, generally they're fixed for the duration of the loan Mm -hmm. or, you know, it's a fixed payment for the duration of the lease. There are some variable rates that you could get, like on mortgages, which are a different animal. And you do have to look at the spread on there and see what the cap is. So on a mortgage, you could get a variable rate. And honestly, I don't have this off the top of my head where, where they are right now. But they're generally lower than a fixed rate. Um, but then they could go much higher. And, and rates, it's one of those things that if, if I could predict that, I'd be mm-hmm. in a different job and very rich, but <laughs> <laughs> I'd be on Wall Street or something. Yeah. But, but, but I highly suspect rates aren't going to go lower anytime soon and probably will creep up. So you do have to kind of look at that um, a variable rate with a closed eye or close eye mm-hmm. to you know, figure out, you know, well, how long am I going to live here? If, am I in this for the long term? Because if you can get a, you know, they have 
they have all sorts of variables. Like you can get a seven year fixed with a 30 year AM. So it's mm-hmm. fixed for a period of time. It could be a little bit lower or you get a three year fixed with 30 year amortization. Mm-hmm. You can get a you know 20 year amortization. I mean, there's all sorts of different things you could look at. The cheapest you can do is a 30 year AM and that's amortization. And that's about as far out as they go. But if you looked at the difference between a 20 year amortization on a loan at, you know, four percent at a 30 year fixed at four and a half percent you would find i mean it's going to be a couple hundred bucks depending on the size of the loan Mm -hmm. but you would find you're paying much more on principle in the early years with a you know 20 year amortization versus a 30. right which is important because you're the principal is actually coming away from your mortgage whereas when you're just paying interest it's kind of like it's almost like rent you're you're not going to see that again um i want to go through the kind of the difference between credit cards and debit cards Mm -hmm. because i thought you had some good interesting points about not Uh, using debit cards so yeah there's well let's talk about yeah what what should you use a credit card for and what should you not use a debit card for yeah well, first, first, I think with both, uh, you know, with a debit card, if if you have a proper setup with your bank, and uh, you know they do offer lines of credit, so you don't happen to get turned down somewhere. But I hope most people use the discipline of the bank by having it rejected if there's not enough money in there. Because um, first of all, if you don't have that line of credit behind it, they will rack the hell out of you with over, overage fees. I had that happen to uh, somebody I know closely had, um, I think it was about 13 transactions. Total value of the transactions was $50. They hit her with over $500 in late fees. Because it was per transaction. Per transaction, yeah. there was a late fee charge. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, what you want to do with a debit card is, is it's it's right out of your account, mm-hmm. so you go, you want to make sure it's set up that you can't overdraw it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where, where again you can get those charges, and and even if you have that little line of credit, eventually you can overdraft that because usually those are limited to three hundred bucks or something, and and the fees they charge on that. I mean, the interest rate is you know exorbitant. So a debit card is something you know that takes it money right out of your bank account. So th- think about it in you know several different ways. I mean, you're still protected on it, but um, let's say you buy something online, and you know my kids do this all the time. They're always using their debit card to buy stuff. Well, something's wrong with that transaction, or somebody gets your card. What happens is is yeah, you may get your money back, but your debit card, uh, you know, they can drain your account. Yes, you're going to get your money back, but what are you going to do for the next week before they straighten it out? Right. So your your debit card is kind of, in my mind, sacred. So you don't want to use it for online transactions. You had some interesting it's, things on this list yeah. that was like, don't use it at restaurants. Don't yeah. use it at outdoor ATMs or gas stations. Yeah. So it's surprising places where you might think like, oh, I do want to use my debit card because I don't want to put gas on a credit card. But maybe you should. No. So, well, so, so here's, here's the thing on a credit card. A credit card... You know, so, so the basic difference is you're protected on a credit card. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you can dispute a charge. So you get charged for something that kind of sets over here, you know, and they extract it from your payments, you know, and even if it's interest, if you're carrying a balance, they extract it and you can dispute the charge, but it's not affecting your bank account. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what's so critical here. So, um, you know, if, as, as like I say, you know, online purchases, what if it gets compromised? Mm-hmm. Uh, you use it at a restaurant. How often do they take your card behind things, you know, mm-hmm. so they make a copy of it. Boom. All of a sudden, they're draining your account. Mm-hmm. Again, you can, you can get your money back eventually. Say that's a false charge. They'll investigate it. But what are you going to do in the meantime? Mm-hmm. And it's harder to it's, do that than disputing yes. a credit card charge. Yes. Yeah. So, and then, yeah, there's skimmers that can get your PIN. Gas stations, they have skimmers. Mm-hmm. So there's just all sorts of ways they can they can get your money without you knowing it. And yes, you were wronged, but it's your bank account. Mm-hmm. Any of those circumstances, if you use a credit card, then you've got options which aren't taking all the money out of your bank account. And so, so it's almost like... I'm saying always use your credit card for almost any transaction, but don't get caught up in not paying it off. And that's, that's, 
difficult because I see how kids use credit cards or mm-hmm. debit cards nowadays. They use it for everything. Yeah. You know, you you said you you set aside cash for yourself each month, but you could you could create your, a whole budget for yourself, sure, so that you know you have enough in each column for your utilities, right. for your car payment. For your groceries and I mean, de facto, I do that because I do track all my utilities and I know what they're costing and I Mm -hmm. know, you know, I know how much money. So, so I do budget that in a way Mm -hmm. because you know your bills are higher in the winter for gas or higher in the summer for electric and you know I do track all that stuff and I know what my insurance and I know Mm -hmm. what my mortgage is. It doesn't change. So, so technically, I have done a budget. It's just I don't want to track the nickel and dime stuff. Right. But that's how I determine the cash to set aside. Yeah. And you can do the same thing. with your debit card too. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, if you think about it, but who, you know, I asked my kids, you guys look at your bank statement. I mean, how do you know what your bank balance is? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm back from the era where stuff didn't appear for days. Oh, yeah. You know, now everything's so instantaneous that, yeah. you know, you're probably pretty safe, you know, when you do a balance inquiry. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty uh, up to date. Yeah, yeah. That, okay, I can be pretty certain on that. But, you know, I lived in the era where well, a transaction may not appear for a day or two and I might think I've got the money and I don't. Mm-hmm. So and if you at least have a, a loose budget, then you know when you're using that credit card to make a purchase, will I be able to pay this off mm-hmm. this month? Will it take me two months? And then you, you won't run into slowly racking up mm-hmm. thousands of dollars and then needing to do a balance transfer and get a third card. And, you know, so if you yeah. if you kind of forecast it, then you can avoid getting into that situation where it's like, oh, I got to I got to chip away at the, the credit card debt. And then, you know, because I was that happened to me after college, where it's like a, you have two or three grand of debt. And it's like I actually need to concentrate on getting this back down to zero because it's just going to be quicksand. Yeah, if I know. Well, well, honestly, how I got rid of mine, because I did, you know, I'm hey, I'm. Just like everybody else, I carried some debt for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, When I refinanced my house, I threw it in. Granted, you don't want to put it in, but, you know, we're not talking tens of thousands of dollars, Mm -hmm. but it was like three grand. I, I'm I'm saying things that's good practice, but you know it's hard in your twenties. Yeah, <laughs> you know? but it, it's yeah, also it's... a good opportunity to get disciplined early. Yeah, yeah. You know? But it is tough to, uh, yeah. to. Well, and I would even say if you carried debt on a credit card, you know, so let's say you did have a bigger purchase, you know, kind of amortize that. Say, well, I want to pay this off within a year. Hell, I I, I had a card that I forgot I had and accidentally used somewhere. This yeah. day and age, it's subscriptions that are probably going to get you because I've yeah. I have two credit cards and I every now and again will just switch up like I'm only going to use this one now and I'll forget that Netflix is on the other card yeah. or you know something I'm subscribed to that just automatically charges each month and then you go back and like oh I have you know thirty or forty dollars charge which isn't too much but I haven't been making any yeah. payments on it. Yeah, so. yeah. My wife had Animoto, five dollars and thirty six cents mm-hmm. every month, <laughs> and I was like, "Get this freaking thing off!" There it was a card we didn't use. Uh, well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I know in the in the presentation we were going over, there was a little bit about stock markets. I, that's probably a whole wormhole, but if there's anything pertinent to mention about investing. Oh, we well, a yeah. Bit about well, that. so again, at a young age, you know, you want to get in retirement as, as soon as you can. And it, it, because the early years, you know, if you extrapolate that for 40 years, it's pretty phenomenal. And, you know, even if you're throwing 10 bucks or different things, you know, here and there, trying to get into some sort of established deferred retirement plan, you know, is, is prudent. And and so, again, I'm not going to get into stock advice, um, but the stock market, in general, if you average it over 10, 20, 30 years, will always gain more than you might earn in something that's interest bearing. Mm-hmm. So, so when you're young, you've got more chance for risk. I mean, if I'm putting all this in, you know, and I wouldn't, I, I'm not saying buy stocks. What I'm saying is you find a mutual fund and mm-hmm. kind of a no load mutual fund, which no load means you don't see, you don't pay fees up front. They kind of take some of your earnings and that's how they, you know, pay pay for the processing, but you can get like an IRA and you find somebody who, you know, handles those or even a bank, you know, could do it and just make sure, you know, they have certain kinds of mutual funds that you could put that in and, and you can basically take that off your income, taxable income for the current year. Mm -hmm. And then it's deferred till when you're retired. Uh, but you know, if you just put it in an interest bearing account, I mean, interest rates were nothing. Mm -hmm. They were like, 
10 basis points, which is a tenth of a percent right. for like four years. And that's for and like a savings account. Yeah, that's like a savings account, mm-hmm. you know, at one tenth of a percent. Mm-hmm. They're coming up a little bit, but maybe half a percent. Whereas the stock market, and again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, and it was actually at an all time record, you know, a year ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and it's down, you know, it's down like 7% this past year, but it was also up like 30% over the last five years. Right. So if you average it, you know, you're still coming out ahead. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, you got to put, you you don't want to put money in there that, you know, is taken away from your living or taken away from your credit card debt. I mean, Mm -hmm. I would always say you pay down your credit card debt, but even there, you know, if you can slip a little bit over here, the earning potential you have in your 20s and what that means to you when you're in your 60s is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and it can build up over time. I I know my one son has an app where all his change goes into some investment account. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, Yeah. like Mm -hmm. all his loose change, and Mm -hmm. it just goes in and it buys shares. So there's stuff that you can just easily do, and, you know, you just don't see it. So it just rounds Mm -hmm. off every transaction Mm -hmm. and throws cents in it. And I'm like, you know, but absolutely, if you got an employer plan, once once you're out there and employed, ask Mm -hmm. your employer what kind of plan they have, Mm -hmm. because where you can make the most money in the early stages is is if they have some sort of match. Mm -hmm. Even if they're giving you 50 cents on the dollar, you put in a dollar, they put in 50 cents. Right. Right there, you're earning 50 Mm percent. You know, it's it's it's, uh, uh, um, you know phenomenal and and especially if you're in the nonprofit world like you know they often have 403b's it's 401k if you're in the for profit world a 403b in the nonprofit world and so even nonprofits have you know those monies but you want to plan ahead i mean social security was never meant to pay for people's retirement mm-hmm. and you know and when you're young and in your formative years that's that's the time to start you know saving i uh i you know, started here in my 20s. Well, when I started, you had to be 30 <laughs> and a year of service to start in our plan. And then when I turned 30, the law changed. <laughs> I went to 27. Yeah. Always like, but I remember that just used to bug the crap out of me. I worked yeah. here three years and I couldn't get a retirement plan. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that's, that's, that's old news and, you know, different laws way back in the 80s. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and some employers, it'll be like, you can contribute like one or 2% of your paycheck to retirement. But if you contribute 3%, then they start matching. Right. And right. then it's worth it. Cause now you're getting 6%, but you're yeah. only on the hook. Yeah. For three. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, for, for example, us, you don't have to put anything in the plan. We give you X. Mm-hmm. If you put in like 3%, then we give you Y. Right. So you get more, mm-hmm. you know, above and, and it's actually a match. So, but a lot of employers, if you don't put in anything, you, you get nothing. Right. And some employers, you know, and, you know, let's say a small for-profit firm, they're not big enough to have it. So then ask them if they can at least get a plan set up where only you contribute, Mm -hmm. you know, even if they can't, but at least if they can do it through payroll deduction so you can get the tax advantages. And then if none of that works, that's where you get an IRA. Mm-hmm. And you know you just have to do it yourself, and you yeah. do it. it kind of it's kind of after tax dollars, but it's it's deducted, and then mm-hmm. you know again it comes. You know, it's what's what's the word? It's after tax, but it's tax deferred. If you get it, it's salary deferral if you do it through your employer because oh, they're yeah. taking it out at the beginning, right. so you're not getting the withholding right then. If you do it as an IRA that you're buying yourself, it's it affects your tax rate when you do your tax return, right. not pre-tax. Mm-hmm. So again, it has the same impact. It's just the timing of it. Right. And the wisdom of getting, of investing in, in like a mutual fund or something is getting in early because mm-hmm. it's a long term. Right. That, that idea of like playing the stock market ups and downs, mm-hmm. that's, that's a casino. Right. But it, that's, that's the dangerous it's, part. But getting in early and staying in with something that you know is fairly safe and you might lose a little. You're in it little, for the long haul. Yeah. yeah. And, might and, lose and, a little one year, gain more the other yeah. year, but over the long term, you'll, yeah. that's what you're saying. There, there were people who, and we had the big stock, stock, and maybe a lot of people don't know this, but stock market, if you're familiar with what the Dow Jones is, it's like 24 or five right now. It, it dipped, it was in the mid teens. It dipped about six or 7,000. Mm-hmm. And that's just the total value of the stocks that are in it. So the market was off, you know, more than 50% mm-hmm. and people freaked you know, when it was bottoming out and said, Oh, I can't do this. I, and they got out of it. Mm-hmm. Well, then it went from six or 7% to 
or six or seven thousand to twenty four thousand. Yeah. Well, the people who got out when it dipped never recouped what they lost. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like whoa, no, that's you don't you don't panic and run after it's. Yeah. After it's dipped, now's the opportunity. Now you're buying because right. you know it's going to go up. And if yeah. you had extra income, that's when you buy. Is right. now sure you can't predict when when's it when did it reach its bottom. Mm-hmm. But you know, as far as that thing was dropping, you know, unless the whole economy collapsed and you know we were Venezuela or something, right? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it. And, and I I'm saying Venezuela because like. If yeah, you know what's going on they in the have economy like a thousand there. Percent inflation yeah, they have inflation. Yeah. Is yeah, it's just totally, totally uh, mm-hmm. out, 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 you know, outlandish. Or like what's Zimbabwe, happening. they had like a thousand yeah. percent inflation yeah. And stuff. Yeah. So, I, uh, so yeah, it's you know the thing is, is you just stick with it. Now, at my age, getting closer to retirement, I've rebalanced it. Mm-hmm. So I still have a lot in mutual funds and different things, but I do have other things like bonds and different things mm-hmm. that, you know, can make up, you know, if I have a big dip here, I'm not necessarily losing over here. Right. But that's more age related mm-hmm. than it is. So, but anybody in their twenties, even thirties, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, just, you want to be aggressive. Yeah. And that's just what you say to whoever, you know, I, I want an aggressive portfolio or mm-hmm. something or half aggressive and half moderately aggressive or right. something, you know, and, yeah. yeah. Hindsight's always 2020, but I graduated right in the middle of that recession and I try to remind myself of how little money I had then, but just mm-hmm. to think if I had put a little bit in 10 years ago, yeah. it, it was not like I'd be a millionaire, but it would be a good little investment that I wouldn't have thought about for 10 <laughs> years and would have been in at the very bottom. And now it's like, you're thinking of the top. So there, 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 will, there, will, there will always be more recessions and, and dips and stuff, but if you're young but it's, and, yeah. you, and you can time that right, then- it's gonna. There, there were a couple thing. stocks I was looking at on, you know, and some banks, bring, you know, teetering because you know there were some bank. It was all, a lot of bank issues, and I do wish I would have gone ahead and, you know, like just bought, you know, a thousand dollars worth of shares. Mm-hmm. And again, I wouldn't have been super rich, but you know, today right. I'd have ten thousand dollars, let's yeah. say, or something. You know, I could have done you know a couple little transactions like that, but I've just never dabbled in individual stocks. I mean. It's that's that's a science. Some people are lucky at that. Mm-hmm. Um, talking to a broker, it'd be like, well, if you know all this, you know, I mean, stockbroker, they don't guarantee anything. Well, this is great. Um, I think a lot of this is just kind of the scratching the surface on some important topics. Hopefully it gives everyone some food for thought. Yeah. And, but you don't need to be the only resource. There are online yeah. resources. Yeah. There are other uh, things you can look into because every situation is different too, but it's good to kind of go over Here's what to expect as you become an adult working in the professional world. Yeah, again, thanks for coming in and talking. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, that's all the time we have for today's program. Thanks, as always, for tuning in and take care. Our theme is Jimmy H. Boogaloo by the Juanitos Creative Commons license from the Free Music Archive.